Hi there, everybody. I hope everybody can uh, can hear me. Um, thank you very much for for attending. It's uh, it's interesting not seeing everybody's faces because uh, I always like to see everybody and, and talk to everybody. And uh, uh, obviously, under circumstances, uh, this is the best way to do it and uh, and the most appropriate way. And and I'm just happy that we're able to now speak wine again because we went for three months three months with very sparse uh, wine talk. So this is awesome for us to be able to say, hey, let's talk some wine. Let's just forget everything that's going on in the world and just talk wine for, uh, for now. Um, so um, just to kind of get things going, first and foremost, thank you every one of you so much for, uh, for in being um, taking the time out of your schedule to to enjoy this uh, uh, little event that we're we're doing here, and uh, we're we're very excited. We're uh, we're very thankful for your support. I, I'm speaking for myself, but also my entire family, um, and I will get into who that uh, whole family is. Uh, but I am also a, a Mac grad. Um, I am probably not uh, uh, that long of a Mac grad. As 14, uh, 2014 was when I actually graduated, so six six long years ago. Um, but uh, we were actually opening up the winery uh, in my uh, in my first year. We were uh, we were starting to open up the winery, so I, I'm still uh, I'm still a little bit fresh. Um, and uh, some of you have may have already me, met me before. Some of you may not have. Um, I know there's quite a few uh, wine club members and things uh, that are actually in the, the alumni, which uh, which is very uh, uh, we were very much appreciated of it. Uh, so thank you, thank you so much for that. Uh, but I wanted to kind of touch base and start at the basics with everybody and uh, kind of start about what uh, who we are as a, as a winery and kind of start from there. So, um, and as, as Dave was saying, by all means, please ask questions as we go through. I will do my best to, to answer them. I love the questions. Wine is about interacting with everybody. So I really want you to uh, feel comfortable and ask all the questions you want. And I will definitely uh, to get to them in a, in a roundabout way. Okay. Um, so, why am I standing here in front of you? Why not someone else in my family? How did I get here? Uh, and basically, who who am I to be doing this uh, this webinar? Um, so for me, I think the the definite connection was the fact that I am a Mac grad as well. Uh, but the reason I got here was how uh, my story begins, and it started all the way back in uh, in Italy, and it was two families that uh, originated in Italy, uh, the culinary family from Molise. Molise is uh, Basically, if you know the boot, it's about uh, two and a half hours southeast of Rome and about an hour north of uh, north of Naples. Um, and we're a little town called Frozzolone, and uh, the, both my father and my uncle were born there, uh, as well as obviously their parents, uh, Giuseppe and Maria, Mike and Nick. So the most uh, stereotypical Italian names you can uh, you can get. Um, and my mom's family was about half hour, forty five minutes from there. Uh, in a region called Campo Basso, uh, but they all met here. Surprisingly, it was uh, they were only half an hour away from each other. I'm like, really? You couldn't have just hopped a fan, said hello, and we've been would have been born in Italy. <laughs> that would have been nice. But uh, so they were very, from very close. Um, they uh, they immigrated here in 1967, um, just in search of a of a better life uh, for uh, for their kids, uh, and they actually were able to work and live at a chicken farm. Uh, a very humble beginning to uh, to start. Um, the my mom's side immigrated in 55 my dad's side in uh, in 1967 um, so they they immigrated here uh, from a very very humble beginning but after they immigrated it was only 13 years after they immigrated that they were able to purchase the 40 acres of land that uh, we currently sit on today uh, so 1980 was when they actually purchased it it was um, my father Nick uh, my uncle Mike and my my grandparents Joseph and Maria um, and believe it or not the three of them uh, my dad and my grandparents took care of all 40 acres of land just the two of them which blows my mind still to this day I think I have a hard day at work and then I think Wow, she uh, she went up and down those rows every day, taking care of forty acres worth of land. It really just blows my mind. Um, so it's uh, uh, it was definitely a a start for not just a winery. They did not have any plans for a winery. It was to make a living, and this was an opportunity to do so. Um, keeping in mind that when they purchased the land, Niagara Lake wasn't oh my god, Niagara Lake wine country. That's how it oh my god, it's amazing now. It was very much a an area of tender fruit of uh, grapes that weren't necessarily meant for wine making at the time Welsh's grape juice was actually made in St. Catharines which is only about um, half hour away from or not even excuse me 10 minutes away from us so a lot of the growers who were growing grapes were growing grapes for them and then of course you had Del Monte canning factory and all the tender fruit and stuff went to to that side so for a good nine years they harvested the grapes and sold to um, to Welsh's but also to a few of the wineries in the area and when Welsh's moved to the states it actually left this 
big hole in the industry. And so a lot of the farmers started pulling out their grapes because they had no one to take these grapes and to make wine out of them was not the greatest. Uh, if you think baby duck or uh, any of those uh, grapes that uh, you're used to hearing from Niagara, uh, that's kind of what the wine would be like if you were to make them. So they says, you know what, let's start pulling out these grapes. And so the government actually stepped in to help the farmers and said, you know what, why don't we help these farmers and, and give them a certain amount of money per vine to pull them out. So my grandparents looked at it and says, oh my gosh, we've got 40 acres of land. We're getting a little older. We can't do this every day anymore. So they says, this is, might be a good time to pull it out. So we pulled out the grapes in 1989 and we actually did nothing with the land for 15 years. And when I say that, most people are surprised, um, but I always have to remind people Niagara on the Lake wasn't what it is now where vacant land is a hot commodity. Back then, it, there wasn't that increased demand for it. So we left it vacant for 15 years. Uh, but in the middle of all that, uh, my father and his brother married my mother and her sister. And I know that's hard to follow, um, but basically it's the two brothers that married the two sisters from different families, not the same family. I know the gears are going and everybody's thinking that way, but two brothers from one family married two sisters from another family, uh, just to keep in with the Italian stereotype, obviously. Um, and then they built their houses all side by side here on the property. So the big thing was, you know what, let's let the kids grow up on this nice big backyard uh, and then we'll see down the road how, how this goes. And, and so I was the byproduct of, of the kids enjoying the backyard. Uh, there was a little go-kart track right where the winery is standing, kind of bitter it's gone, but whatever. Um, but essentially it was just our home. It was where we grew up. And so uh, 15 years went by pretty quick. And finally one day we were sitting in the backyard and, uh, and after a few times people of knocking on the door saying, hey guys, what are you doing with the land? Can we buy it? Can we lease it? We all looked out in the back and says, uh, maybe it's time we either sell this thing off or, or do something with it. So after humming and hawing, we says, how do we part with the land that, uh, you know, our grandparents built up and, and our, how we grew up on it. So at the end of the day, we said, okay, so let's do something with it. And our parents said either Christmas trees or grapes. And we thought, eh, it's a pretty easy decision on our end. So we said, let's go with the grape side of things. And so we um, put, put the, uh, the vines back in the ground in 2004. Um, with a certain, uh, we put 10 varietals in, five whites, five reds. Um, so a good mix of the both. We had uh, Riesling, Vidal, Gewürztraminer, Chardonnay, and Pinot Grigio for your whites. Uh, the reds being the Cabernet Franc, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Syrah, and Pinot Noir. So definitely a good mix of the, uh, of the bunch. Um, a lot of times the follow-up question people have to that is, oh, Chris, you guys are of Italian descent. Why don't you have the Italian grape varietals and uh, for us starting out a new vineyard a new business we wanted to have vines that we knew were going to do well here and know that um, that they would actually take versus starting with Italian varietals that for the most part they don't necessarily like depending on the, the varietal they don't necessarily like our climate too well they like heat they don't like our winters so rather than uh, risk it on on those we says let's do things that we know are definitely able to be grown in Niagara and then down the road, we say, we'll say, maybe we experiment with things like Corvina or Sangiovese and all the, uh, the usual suspects in the Italian world. Um, so we planted those 10 varietals and uh, we said, okay, now we've got this, this vineyard. What do we do? Do we just grow for people again or do we finally finish off the, uh, the process? Um, so we've hung and hawing again, talking to people and they said, you know what, why don't you just finish off the process? And so in 2008, it was right when we actually put the shovel in the ground for the winery. Two years later, 2010 was when we actually opened up the doors. So we're actually just shy of 10 years. September, uh, Labor Day weekend will be 10 years uh, for us, which is exciting. Um, won't be too much of a party nowadays, but uh, it will be exciting that uh, we have actually been around for, for 10 years. Uh, and a lot of times people ask me, Chris, how long does it take you guys to kind of get off the ground? And uh, it does take a long time. Uh, a lot of people think, hey, you know, the glamorous winery, uh, you know, makes a lot of money right away and so on. It takes a lot of time and a lot of hard work to get off the ground. And so a lot of times people say, hey, I'm going to retire and get a winery or I'm going to retire and buy a vineyard. It's not a retirement. Uh, it is a lot of work and, uh, and it takes a long time for things to, to kind of get off the ground. Um, so we're finally getting our feet uh, off the ground, but uh, we also wanted to make things feel like uh, they were an old world feel. So the whole theme of, of the, I guess this webinar as well, but also the winery was uh, an, a new world winery because we're in Niagara Lake but with old world roots. And we really wanted to play that 
throughout everything we do, whether it's a presentation, whether it's labels, whether it's uh, tastings, that's kind of our theme of what we, uh, what we want to do. So uh, a way in which we did that was obviously the look of the building. You've probably by now seen the, the look of the building and how we made it very much feel like a, a village, like walking down a street in Italy. Uh, but the other part of it is how we make our wine. So in Niagara, uh, yes, it's a good region for making wine, um, and it has no reason not to be being on the same latitude as um, southern France and northern Italy. Uh, and with this escarpment that we have, uh, it really is a great region to, to make wine. But we were also became accustomed through our Italian heritage with uh, bolder wines, with more intense wines, uh, with things that are full flavored. So how do we get that in an area that is not necessarily known for bold wines? And we decided to go through a road called appassimento. Appassimento is literally, it's just a word that means withering of the grapes. So what we'll do is we will hand harvest everything, put them into um, almost look like baker's racks, but they're, so they're all perforated and only one layer of grapes sits inside of these, uh, these racks. We'll stack them on top of each other turn on big fans, get air moving like crazy, and basically dehydrate the grape a little bit, not to the point of raisins, because you still need juice, but uh, essentially it just gives you a little bit more concentration, a little bit more uh, full flavor in the grapes. Ends up being a little higher on the sugar side of things, not that our wines are sweet, it's just that our wines end up being a little higher on the alcohol side, which no one seems to mind that side of things. Uh, but essentially, it just creates for us a bolder, more intensified, more powerful feeling wine that we have come accustomed to. Um, and nowadays, after the years that we've been open, have become known for is this bolder, more intensified feel. Um, so as we were going through all of this, we said, okay, let's, let's do this. Let's make this new world winery. Let's do this old world feel but at the same time, um, stick with our, uh, our roots as well. So we employed the impasamento method. Um, our labels, we've kind of had this new world, old world feel to them. Uh, you've probably seen some of the bottles already. Um, they have this new world and old world feel to them as well. So throughout everything that we've been doing, um, that's kind of how, how we've gone. Um, and I've got a question actually, uh, which ties really nicely to this. Uh, why still cork? Um, a lot of people say, uh, you know, why, why use cork? Why not use, um, uh, you know, screw caps and things like that? Um, for us, it has absolutely nothing to do with performance because in terms of performance factor, um, your screw caps are going to work 100% of the time. There's no uh, guesswork there. Whereas with cork, you get the, the natural cork, at least you get, um, there's a percentage of times that it might not work properly. Um, whether it doesn't seal ba back into the, the bottle properly or whatever have you, uh, it will spoil the wine. And unfortunately, uh, the, the wine is not savable at that point. For us, it has absolutely nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with the feel. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, you've got the look of the winery. We've got the old world feel. The cork just basically ties into the whole process. Think, think okay, you're at a really nice candlelit dinner and the server comes over and pops a cork versus pops a screw cap. It's just as silly as it sounds because it has absolutely nothing you know, to do with the wine inside, but it makes you feel a little bit more special. It makes you feel a little bit more, um, you know, it's this uh, uh, atmosphere, I guess is the best word to use for it, uh, for wine. Whereas uh, a screw cap, like I said, there's nothing wrong with the wine inside of screw caps. I've had some fantastic wines and screw caps, but it doesn't, uh, for us, it doesn't give the same image that, uh, that we're looking for. But uh, uh, very good question in, in that respect. Uh, with respect to uh, to the cork. Um, so I'm going to, that's answered. Perfect. Uh, do you use your chemistry background in developing your wines? That's a good question. Um, so uh, why, with me, I, I personally am running multifacets of the business um, where um, there's definitely winemaking everywhere we go in the winery world. Um, I personally am not physically doing the, um, the wine side of things, uh, but my chemistry background and uh, obviously someone knew I was a, chem a chemistry grad. Uh, yes, I graduated from chemistry. I, I should have said that. Um, but uh, the chemistry background is so helpful when, when it comes to understanding what's needing to be done to the wines, why we're doing it to the wines, uh, the reactions behind that, um, and further explaining it to people who come in on a daily basis. Uh, um, because the, a lot of people are interested in the, the science background of things. However, having said that, um, I'm conflicted in my brain because I've been trained through uh, my Bachelor of, of Chemistry that uh, um, you're logical, right? You're, 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 um, your reactions are as such, everything is logical, but with wine, it's not just science. There's that other side of it that is the artistry side. 
and there's a side that really science can't really explain too well. And that is the, how do you know when that wine is ready? How do you know, uh, you know, what factors are giving you that, wow, what is that wine? And that is all done by, by the mouth, by the nose, and of course the eyes for your color. Uh, but a lot of that comes down to that palate and that nose of being able to understand that and how uh, science doesn't really tell you that. Science can tell you what the alcohol percentage is, what the sulfur levels are, all that good stuff, but it doesn't matter because it has to mesh on the palate. And that's the, uh, that's the beauty of, um, of the wine industry is that you get this both, uh, not competing, but both avenues where you get the science, but you also get the artistry. So yes, the chemistry side has helped, uh, but there is also that unexplainable side where you just got to experience it. You just have to try wines. You just have to really kind of try things back to back and, and taste more as if we need an excuse to do so. But uh, you do have to, to taste more and then use your, your science as a, uh, as a tool to, to back that up. So, uh, but great question in, uh, in that side of things. Absolutely. Um, so um, I always have to keep an eye on the time for, for us Italians here, because as you can tell, we speak with our hands and we like to talk. So uh, since it's 20 after, I think maybe I'll, uh, I'll start talking about the wines because um, uh, there's uh, obviously a lot to go through with these, even just these three wines. It is really amazing to, to, to go through them. Um, so the first one I'm going to go through is the, is the Pinot Grigio. Then we'll go to the, uh, the Corposo, which is our Reposo style wine. And we'll finish with the, uh, with the Merlot. Um, always, I usually like to go white to red, bold to, bold to, to uh, excuse me, light, lighter to bolder. Uh, so we're going to start with the Pinot Grigio. Now, um, this is, I, I, I always like showcasing this, this wine for people who've never been here before, people who've never tried our wines before, um, because a lot of times Pinot Grigio can just kind of be there. There's not a lot of character to it. They're thin a lot of times. Um, Color-wise, there's not a lot to them. Um, you know what? You're sitting by the pool. You want to have a few glasses of wine. That's kind of usually where Pinot Grigio lies. Ours is completely different. Um, it is the total opposite of what I just described. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with, um, with the apostamento style. So uh, if you have it in front of you uh, and are pouring it, um, the first thing that you see right away is the color of it. Uh, the color is absolutely spectacular. If you don't have it in front of you, uh, you can sort of see the color. Uh, that's not my hand in interacting with it. That's actually the color. It's like a peachy coppery color. Uh, if you, I don't know if you've ever actually seen Pinot Grigio grapes before, but they're actually a really dark burgundy color. Um, they grow very similarly to Pinot Noir. They grow almost identically. If you were colorblind in the vineyard and you couldn't see the difference in color, you honestly couldn't tell the difference because they grow very similarly. They're both very tight bunch. Uh, they're both very uh, thin skinned. The only difference is that the Pinot Gris is lighter in color than the Pinot Noir, and that's indicative of the name, Noir and Gris, uh, black and gray, one's just a lighter shade of the other. So because we leave it with those skins just a little bit of time, we're talking uh, 12 to 24 hours, depending on the vintage, we get this kind of a peachy, coppery looking color that, uh, that comes from it. And so for us, it just makes it presentable. Um, I always say when we're tasting, when we're enjoying wine, we often forget about our eyes and our eyes are always the first impression of the wine. And so if we can give it a, a decent color, it always helps in the experience of the, uh, of the wine. Uh, then you go through and, and you taste it and it actually comes alive. It's flavorful. Uh, and a, a lot of times red wine drinkers say to me, Chris, I'm, I'm surprised I actually enjoy this wine because it actually has some flavor to it. And that stems right from the apostamento style. Uh, and so if, if you saw the notes or if you didn't see the notes there, it's 40%. So 40% of the crop we take, we dry them, and then we blend it back in with the other juices and wine. So essentially it gives it just that little extra power, that little extra oomph. And alcohol wise, it's 12% alcohol. So it actually is just a little fraction higher than your normal, but because it's so full flavored, it's so well integrated. And the last thing we're, we do to it that makes it a little bit different is the fact that we actually put it in barrel for seven months, which is a little unusual with respect to Pinot Grigio, but what we do is put it in older barrels. So the idea here is that we're not wanting the big oak character, we're wanting the softness that comes from aging in barrels. So by putting it in older barrels, you're not getting the harshness of the oak character, it's just the, the back end, it's softening the back end, making it very drinkable. Sometimes people have told me, oh, I've, I've had Pinot Grigio before and it's, it's a little bit acidic and so on, where the barrel takes that, that edge off. So it'll be surprisingly creamy, surprisingly smooth, 
and really full flavored. Um, you know, people a lot of times say, oh, I can't get the hints of this and hints of that. As soon as you do a pasamento to this, you're really starting to get the fruit flavors to really pop out. So you're really starting to get that peach character. You're really starting to get the, the melon and all kinds of the honey and all kinds of flavors really jumping out at you, uh, which is, I, I think, uh, absolutely incredible, especially when you're dealing with something that's not normally uh, as such. Uh, food wise, I know there's someone uh, out there that uh, did make some food pairings while uh, uh, for the for the event, which is great. Uh, but uh, food pairing wise, th this is a wine that you actually can pair with food where sometimes Pinot Grigio's it might be too light. This one has some good flavor that you can actually put it with food. Uh, my personal favorite, and again, this is my Italian upbringing, uh, gnocchi gorgonzola is my absolute favorite dish. And this is a perfect match because it's bold enough that it can actually you know, um, cut through the, the thickness of the, um, the gorgonzola cream sauce. So it's a beautiful wine to even pair with food. I think it's so smooth on a day, especially on a hot day like today, that it's so easy to, uh, to enjoy. Um, but, uh, um, it is, uh, definitely a, a wine that we do, uh, we do well, um, and we really enjoy it. Uh, I'm just going to see if we have a couple of questions. Uh, why do we uh, require sulfite warning? Good, uh, good question, actually. Um, so, the um, by law we're allowed we have to um, use or we have to use the label must contain sulfites you'll notice it on the pinot grigio you'll notice it on the corposo you'll notice it on the merlot um, so we have to put that on there uh, as a legal restriction because some people are um, more or less um, sensitive to sulfur compounds in wine um, the only problem with that is that it doesn't really tell you a whole lot because Sulfur is natural, sulfur is added, sulfur is used for cleaning. Um, so it doesn't tell you a whole lot in, this, in the fact of how much sulfur. Um, so just by looking and saying contain sulfites, it doesn't really tell you if it's going to have a lot or little. We're just required to put it on saying that we have added um, or it's natural sulfur within the, uh, within the wine. I'm not sure if that answers the question, but that's, that's the reason we have to put it on there. Um, if interprovincial trade barriers on alcohol were lifted, do you think your wines would sell in BC, Quebec? Uh, oh, uh, so we're, we're probably the wrong person to ask that question to, uh, being that we're actually a quite of a small winery. Um, in the grand scheme of things, we only do about 10,000 cases of wine per year. Um, so we're not uh, you know, a huge winery that can distribute very readily. We do a little bit through, uh, through Manitoba uh, and we sell to personal addresses uh, pretty much everywhere. Um, but it, with respect to um, trade, because Ontario is, they, their liquor laws are pretty strict as well. Um, they don't like the, the alcohol leaving the province uh, because obviously tax money. Um, but I think little by little, you'll start seeing more and more, um, you know, wineries in these little shops across Canada. We're, like I said, not the best um, example of that because we're a smaller place whereas you know someone who's producing 50,000 100,000 cases of wine a year might have better luck in that respect um, but we're we do like I said we do a little bit in, in uh, Manitoba and just a fraction in, uh, in Saskatchewan but it's more privately owned stores that purchase it from us and then they sell it in their uh, their own stores but that's a that's a great question um, so the, the Pinot Grigio. Now the, um, the last thing I always talk about with us, um, because with wine, uh, I find with wine, it's always a story. Um, we all, um, whenever we get together, more so with wine than, than beer or, or uh, liquor, I find there's always a story. People always tend to talk about stories. People always tend to share stories with people. And so we decided to kind of go down that road too. So every wine actually tells a little story about who we are, and who the family is. And, uh, and the Pinot Grigio is actually one of um, the most special stories that we have because um, as I mentioned, two brothers married two sisters and they have their kids. But unfortunately, one of the sisters was not uh, around to see the winery get opened. Um, she passed away about a year before we opened up. So we did her label first. It was the very first label we wanted. She loved things that were different. So we picked the Pinot Grigio for her because of how different that Pinot Grigio was. Um, and I'll actually hold up the, uh, the label as I'm talking for those who don't have it in front of them. Um, so we, her mother used to call her Cavallone, which is slang Italian for horse. And you think that's a terrible nickname for someone. Why would you call him a horse? Um, you have to think like old Italians. They never had uh, machinery. They had horses and donkeys to do a lot of the work for them. So to call her, that meant that she was the workhorse, very strong, very determined, free spirited. So you'll see this beautiful majestic horse on the label and through her eyes, kids never grew up. So on the top of the horse are her two kids. Tara wasn't ready to let her mom go. So she's holding onto the horse and Michael's waving goodbye. And she's running on the rocks because she always called her husband, Mike, her rock. 
So we, we have a little, little story associated with all those because whenever we got together, that's what we did. We said, remember when you did this? Remember when your mom called you this? And so on and so forth. Uh, so they all have a little story, hence the wording at the tops of the, uh, on the bottles and on, at the tops of your, uh, of your sheets, which is the Cavallone word for the Pinot Grigio. So, all righty. So that's the, that's the Pinot Grigio. Um, hopefully you enjoyed that. And uh, we'll, I've got no open questions. So we'll, we'll, I guess we'll move on to the, uh, oh, I, one just came in. Is the artwork original creations from local artists or where does the artwork come from? Um, yeah, they are uh, our creations. So we basically sat down with a graphic designer local guy actually and uh, he we sat down with him individually a very patient man as you can imagine sitting down with each one of us and we said okay this is what we want to see on our labels this is the aspects we want to want highlighted this is what we want on the labels and then he basically did a drawing based on what we talked about um, if it was one of the family members it would just be stick people on our labels but uh, so we got someone actually much more talented than us to do that um, and uh, and so he created the artwork for us like this is our design this is not uh, uh, an artist that hey we you know, we've got this picture let's put it on a label no it was designed for us for our stories that uh, we wanted uh, associated to the uh, to the wines so good question though so on to the uh, on to the ripasso, the corposo. Um, now, this is a, a very interesting, uh, very interesting wine. This is a wine that, for any time, with whatever, however, whenever, it is the most approachable red wine that that we have. Um, it is a wine that um, you know what it's Wednesday. You don't know who's coming over. You want to just have a glass of wine. You know, it's not a special occasion or anything like that. This is such a beautiful wine. And this is how it was created right from the start from us, but also how it started in Italy. So Amarone is the wine. I don't know um, if you haven't heard of it. It's a big, bold red wine made in Northern Italy in the region called Valpolicella. And this is where we got this appassimento style from is they employed this method in Valpolicella. Um, so essentially what we, what we took from that is the appassimento, but also the ripasso because Amarone, if you've ever bought a bottle of Amarone, they're, um, they're on the pricier side of things. Uh, a good one kind of starts around 50, 60 bucks and then they go much higher from that. Um, so the Italian says, okay, well, we love this wine, but we can't afford to drink it every day. So they said, okay, well, let's take the skins from the Amarone, the dried grape skins from the Amarone. Once they're pressed with that wine, recapture them because there's still lots of color, lots of tannin left in the skins. Put them into juice. They did not dry the grapes to bake, so non-apassimento wine. Let it soak for a little bit of time and press it one more time. So repassing of skins or ripasso. So that's where the word actually came from. Italians are very simple. They call it what it is and that's exactly it. Um, so ripasso was a byproduct, I guess, of the appassimento style. So that became that every day with whatever, however, the skins from the Amarone gave it the, the richness up front, but on the back end, it was still an easy drinking wine that people could enjoy anytime, no matter what day of the week, as I was mentioning that it was. So this is exactly how we um, formulated our Corposo as well, to be that wine for any time. Um, so at the heart of our Corposo, it's 70% Cabernet Franc, 30% Cabernet Sauvignon. Then we took the appassimento skin, so all the dried grape skins from our Merlot, the, the Cab Sauv, the Cab Franc, the Syrah, took all those skins, put them back into this to let it soak for about a week. Then once we thought we were happy with how the extraction was, we'd press those skins off again and repress, uh, sorry, press the skins again and then age the wine as we, we saw fit. So again, what that did was just give it a little bit extra power up front. Even though it's not intended to be a bold wine, it still gives it that extra power up front. Um, so that's how we do our, our Repasso style. Um, it's, it's a wine, like I said, food pairing wise, anything you wanna do with it for the most part, it can handle um, pizza, pasta. The, the fact that it's 70% um, Cabernet Franc ha helps us with the acidic dishes. Cabernet Franc is, has a little higher acidity in the grape and as a wine therefore. Um, and so it really helps go with your, your tomato sauces, your um, anything tomato based. So that's why we say pizza, pasta or anything on the, uh, on the food pairing because it definitely can handle that side of things. Uh, if you wanted to go lighter, you can. If you wanted to go heavier, you can. Food, um, people wise, no matter if they like bold or if they like light, most of the time people can agree on, uh, on this wine in, in particular. 
Um, why don't they use sugar code 0123 anymore? That's a good question because um, I found that was a little bit easier to understand. Um, uh, so what they're referring, what she's referring to is um, uh, in the LCBO, I guess uh, uh, they would have a sugar code 0, 1, 2, 3, and that would tell you the sweetness levels of your, uh, of your wines. Um, now they've switched it to, they'll either put the grams per liter or they'll say dry, off dry, semi dry, semi sweet, and all that stuff. Uh, I find that, those, that terminology a little bit more confusing than the sugar code. The sugar code basically refers to your grams per liter. So if you have it in front of you, the, um, uh, the sheet that I sent out, um, it'll give you the sugar content. And basically you take that, that value divided by by 10 and whatever the placeholder is, whether it's a zero or a one, that's your sugar code. Um, I find that was, a, that was a better representation of what those wines actually were. So for example, the Pinot Grigio is only 9.7 grams per liter of sugar. So it would technically fall as a zero, even though it's closer to a one. But I find that gives you a better idea. I don't know why they got rid of it. That's the only thing I don't know is why they said, okay, let's, let's go away with this. Maybe people weren't understanding it. Um, but I find it was a better representation of what the wine actually gave you versus what they currently do because off dry to some is not off dry to others. And there's a lot of ambiguity with those terms. So I, I found the sugar codes um, were more helpful, but good question. Um, so the, uh, the Repasso, um, I think that was uh, everything. If, uh, if you had any questions about the Repasso, please fire away. I'm happy to, uh, to answer them by all means. Um, if no, no other questions, well, I guess we're moving on to, uh, to the Merlot. Uh, now, a lot of times I get a little bit of um, pushback. Someone says, Chris, why the, why the Merlot at the end? Merlot is generally a lighter wine. I don't want to try Merlot. Uh, Merlot got a bad rap from, uh, from the movie Sideways as well. Um, you know, don't pour me another Merlot. Uh, where, so a lot of times Merlot gets a pretty bad rap. Um, what I will say is here on our vineyard, Merlot is a rock star. Uh, it does super well on our really rich clay soil. Where we are, um, we're not right in Niagara on the Lake. We're on the St. David's bench, we call it. Uh, so it's still technically part of Niagara on the Lake, but it's in the St. David's area, which is kind of closer to the highway area. Uh, we're on um, not the plains of Niagara on the Lake, but if you come up, there's a little bench before you get on, on top of the escarpment. And that's where we are. And what we're dealing with in our area is really, really rich clay soil. They pull a lot of soil from our area for, for use of bricks. That's how, how rich this clay soil actually is. Um, so the reds really like that, that really um, nice clay. And so the Merlot does super, super well on our vineyard. Um, it really likes the, um, uh, the clay. But also, we're also dealing with a little bit different of a climate with respect to where we are versus where others are in Niagara Lake. We are generally a little bit warmer on average uh, in the winter, um, in the summer. So we're definitely getting more conducive to red wine production and that side of things. So you end up getting not only from the Apasamento, but where we're located, a much richer feel to our reds than, than most. And this Merlot is, is absolutely no exception. Um, if you looked ahead or tasted it, you're already seeing how rich and how powerful this wine actually is. It's 16% alcohol. Like it's a, it's a big wine. We're doing 80% of the grapes dried. So now you're starting to get the feel of the Apasamento and what it's doing. Uh, it's rich from start to finish. You're getting good uh, fruit character, but also that nice chocolatey feel that Merlot is used for or known for. And a little bit of the spice. Now the spice is directly indicative of the year that we produce. So, and I haven't really talked about that just yet, but the Pinot Grigio was from 2017. The Corposo and the um, Merlot were from 2018. And a lot of people say, oh, Chris, the year, oh, it's a good year. Oh, it's not a good year. It's, you know, what should we drink? Which year should we drink? Years um, are very misleading sometimes. Um, yes, there are good and bad years in terms of growing conditions and what we deal with. Um, there are good and bad years with respect to wine in terms of what your preferences are. But because we had a stressful year out in the vineyard does not necessarily mean the wine is going to be bad because we had a good year out in the vineyard did not necessarily mean the wine is going to be good. Your preferences change, your preferences are, are your preferences. So it doesn't, the year does not automatically mean that you will like that wine. And this is a good representation of this because 2018 for us here in Niagara was not the greatest year that we've had in terms of growing season. 
it was rather wet. We didn't really get much of a summer. Um, I can count on probably one hand how many times it actually exceeded 30 degrees Celsius. So it was a bit of a, a worrisome year. Um, 2019 as well, uh, followed along that same suit. Um, so if you were looking at it from a standpoint of saying, yeah, you know, not a great growing season, so the wine can't be good. We're showing you two good reasons as to why that might not be the case. Uh, 2018 was the Corposo, and that is a beautiful wine. Now we're getting the richness from the Merlot on 2018 as well. So it, it, just because there's a, a particular year does not necessarily mean you will like or hate the wine that, uh, that you're given. Uh, the Pinot Grigio 2017, um, I always say, was the year that people forgot. Um, 2016 was very hot, very dry, and 2017 followed that up. And because everyone was still focused on 2016, 2017 got forgotten. And that was honestly such a, a great year for uh, interesting wines because 2017 was cool and, and pretty rainy to the start. And then all of a sudden in the middle of August, it's like someone snapped their finger and we had hot 30 degree weather and dry up until we pulled all the grapes off. It was actually spectacular. Uh, so what we got in that particular year was the, um, the, the intricacies and the, and the complexities of a cool year, but the ripeness and the, the body of a hot year. So that was, 2017 was actually um, a, a very underrated year. Um, 2008, what is your prediction for this growing season so far? Um, it, it's fun. Life is about balance, I, I always say. Um, wine is about balance. Life is about balance. And in this particular year, things have not been going well inside, obviously with the, with everything going on. So um, what happens when things aren't going well inside, things go well outside. So we're actually uh, so far, knock on wood, this is actually turning out to be some, a really good growing season if things remain the same. We've had heat when we needed it. We've had rain when we needed it. Um, we've had some uh, really con uh, consistent early start to the season. Um, if everything goes well, it'll actually be some good fruit coming in, uh, in for us this year, which I'm actually very happy with after coming off of two years where we were a little bit stressed in the, uh, in the vineyard. So this year it's actually shaping up knock on wood. We don't really say formally until the grapes are off the vine, but knock on wood, if this keeps up, we should uh, be looking at some, uh, some pretty nice fruit. Um, so the Corposo, um, did you say it was made from one particular grape? So the Corposo, to go back to that, I had a question about that. It's actually 70% Cabernet Franc, 30% Cabernet Sauvignon uh, at the blend, at the heart. The skins were Cab Franc, Cab Sauve, Merlot, Syrah. So the four different skins, all reds, were what we used to put back in. The wine at the beginning was 70% Cabernet Franc, 30% Cabernet Sauvignon. I hope that answers the, the question there. Uh, I would like to know how long the, the Corposo was left sitting in the barrels and what kind of barrels were used. So most of what we do with respect to um, aging our wines um, and aging, whether it's white, red, sweet, dry, most of what we do is, um, is a lot of French oak. Um, we like to age our wines for a good amount of time. So we're using French oak so that we don't get too much of that oak influence coming from it. Um, the, with respect to the Corposo, it was left 15 months in the, uh, in the barrel. Um, and those were, uh, were relative, they're one, one time use barrels. So we, left it in there for 15 months versus the Pinot Grigio was only seven in, in older barrels. This is now 15 months, uh, which is not an exorbitant amount of time either. For us, it's more of an average of, uh, of what we're doing uh, is the 15 month time. The Corposo, however, on that end, or excuse me, the, the Merlot on that end, uh, we're actually aging that for about 20 months in the, uh, in the barrel. So it's much longer because it needs it. It needs to soften up. The Merlot is such a big wine that we really need that, uh, that softening from the, uh, from the oak to really help, uh, help, that, uh, help that through. Uh, but that was a very good question. Um, I think I've gotten to most of the questions. Let me just scroll down here. Um, why are some wines better left uh, to breathe? That's a, that's a very good question. So um, a lot of times um, certain wines do better when they're given air. Um, so for example, something like a newer red, something that's just come out of the bottle, it's relatively uh, early vintage, newer year, um, you wanna give it time to breathe. Um, something that's been uh, you know, aged for a long time, it's been stuck in a bottle for a long time, you wanna give it some time to breathe. 
just basically helps the wine open up. Uh, and I, I kind of, um, I, I giggle a little bit with this explanation, but if I took you and shoved you inside of a bottle, you'd be a little upset, right? And that's how the wine is. It's, it's not, it's, it's stuck, it's tight, right? So as you let it breathe, it's just basically stretching out, stretching out the limbs, letting you, you know, letting it breathe and really allows the uh, aromatics and the flavors to, to come forward. Having said that, that's not always the case, um, depending on how wine the wine, the, how old the wine actually is. If the wine is very old, sometimes aerating it can actually spoil it. That's how, how close it is right on the, um, right on the cusp. Um, so, uh, so usually air is, is good. Long time of air is not good, you know, leaving it on the, on the, um, the counter for, you know, four or five, six, seven days. Uh, you know, if you have that problem, I don't have that problem, but if you do, um, that's not necessarily good. Uh, but giving it air right away. And this is why you see people swirling their glass all the time. That's a, a good way to, uh, to open it up and release those aromatics and release those flavors uh, uh, to it. Um, oh, I forgot to talk about the labels. Yes, thank you for reminding me of the labels on, the, on each of the, uh, the two wines. Um, so the, uh, the Corposo, which sounds like a, a weird name that, uh, that we gave it. Corposo in Italian means body, and uh, I'll hold up the, the label again for that. Uh, corposo it means body, and it has nothing to do with the, the body of the wine itself. It has everything to do with the label, uh, because in my grandfather's world, you never wasted anything. Everything you, are, you use, absolutely everything you can. So for in wine world, anything he put inside of his wine press had to come out. So he would use his full body and turn that thing as hard as he possibly could. So on the label, you see a guy turning his wine press here using a, a lot of force. And he always wore this hat anytime he was making wine, anytime he was um, uh, in the garden, he always wore this hat. And we actually have the hat uh, in, the, uh, in the winery. Uh, if you come to do a tasting, you'll see it uh, displayed there uh, uh, looking, uh, looking over us. Uh, so that's the, uh, the Corposo, the, the Merlot. Uh, the Merlot is my brother, so it doesn't really matter. No, uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, this is the, uh, the Merlot. Um, so this one is uh, my brother Nicholas's label, and he is very talented with AutoCAD, very talented in the uh, architecture side of things. Um, so for his label, um, we wanted to have him very pensive. So we called it Pensieri for thoughts. He's a very pensive guy. He likes to be thinking on his own, uh, likes to be by himself, and so to, to think. And so we called it Pensieri. So the guy is actually holding a model. It's hard to, hard to see. The guy is actually holding a model in his hand in a dark room. And of course, you see the glass of wine for inspiration. Um, but my brother is also a comic book fan. He really enjoys, uh, Wolverine is his favorite uh, comic book guy. So the designer actually gave him um, the, the sideburns of, of Wolverine. And then uh, it's hard to see, but in the back, there'll be scratch marks uh, from, the, from the claws of Wolverine uh, on it. So the, it, it's, it's fun to that, you know, we have all these. Uh, is, is there a label on my story? Yes. Uh, see, I'm being completely impartial to me. Uh, mine is the, uh, the Pinot Noir. I think I actually happen to have it here. Um, Ah, there it is. Uh, mine is the, the Pinot Noir. Uh, I'm the entertainer of the family, polar opposite to my, uh, to my brother. Uh, so there's, uh, I, I'm, I play piano, guitar, and sing, so I love when I'm playing and people are having a good time. So the guy's sitting at a piano, big smile on his face, people dancing all in the background, and uh, just basically a, a party where my brother is, is thinking by himself. So it's fun how, um, you know, we all have our personalities, and I think every family has that. Um, every family has their quirks, and every family has their... Uh, their um, there are different personalities to them for sure. Uh, the other weird thing with that is when we were picking the wines, because we all got to pick the wine we wanted, the wine personality also kind of matched the personality of the person who picked it. Like the, you know, the big, bold Cabernet Sauvignon was the one my uncle picked. And, you know, the fun, entertaining Pinot Noir was, was me because I'm the entertainer. And it was just funny how they all kind of lined up and, uh, in, a, in a particular way, which was kind of fun. Um, when you talk about the skins in the process, are they dried, aged in any way, uh, just raw skins to add flavor? Is it the same technique for Italian Amarone? Um, I'm assuming that's talking about the Corposo with respect to the ripasso, um, they are the dry, the apassamento skins. They are um, strictly the dried grapes. So for example, the Merlot, where we have 80% of the grapes being dried, we're using those skins that we, um, that we uh, once they're done fermentation with their own wine, we'll reclaim those skins and add them back into the corposo. So it is only the apasamento skins. That's what makes ripasso so unique. It's not just a, a repassing of whichever skins we want. It's a repassing of the apasamento skins. And that's, that's how they do it with, um, with Amarone as well. The, the Amarone starts, and that's the, the big, bold, rich wine. Once they're done with the skins for Amarone, once they press the skins, 
we will then take them, or sorry, they will take them and put them back into the repasso that whatever blend they happen to use, it goes back into, uh, into the repasso. So it is sp strictly the, uh, the dried grape skins. Uh, and depending on the year, we might use the ones from this particular year, or we might use next year's, uh, depending on the year we're given. Like, let's say, for example, we really like the skins from, let's say this year, because it's going to be hot and dry, and we like the phenolic compounds and so on and so forth. We might use the ones from this year, even though the wine has already been made. So it can be done right at fermentation, right when the wine is pressed, or it can be done after when the, the wine has been aged for a long time. Uh, we can still use different skins to, uh, to help it out. So the repostos can be done at any time uh, uh, as well. But, uh, food pairing on the Merlot, uh, good question, because I forgot to do that, my apologies. Um, Merlot, I love, for me, the, the perfect pairing with the Merlot is lamb. And again, maybe that's, maybe that's my Italian roots coming out, but lamb is such an, an amazing food to to put with the merlot it does so well the flavor profile and again this particular merlot because it has enough body to stand up to that side of things um you can do um all kinds of bolder we do like um in our um, our uh, you know tradition we do like a, a meat stew we call it spezzadino it's uh, like a, a really hearty meat stew it has some spices you basically put whatever you want whether it's rabbit meat pig you know whatever you want um and that goes really, really well with it as well, because it's, again, it's that gamey feel to it and it goes really, really nicely with it. If you're talking away from the meat side, um, definitely the, uh, the cheeses, your really sharp cheeses are really, really nice with it. Um, you can do a, almost like an eggplant. Um, my, my father nowadays is obsessed with eggplant because probably because it's eggplant season, but um, putting uh, eggplant or zucchini uh, on the barbecue and adding some seasoning with this absolutely wonderful. Um, the possibilities for a, that boldness is, is just uh, uh, endless for sure. But, um, how long is the withering of the grapes process? Good, good question. Um, depends. Depends on your year, depends on what wine you're trying to make. Um, so for example, the Pinot Grigio, 40% of the grapes are dried, but let's, and let's say the Merlot was also 40% they would not spend the same amount of time drying. Um, so something like the Pinot Grigio where we still want it to be relatively light, um, will only do about one to two weeks worth of drying, depending on the year. For example, this year being so hot, we might pull back a little bit uh, on, the, on the drying because it's been so hot and the grapes are already uh, shriveled to begin with or small to begin with. So something like the Pinot Grigio, maybe only one to two weeks. Something like the Merlot, we might be looking at four or five weeks, depending on the year. Our Cab Sauve, which is our Amarone style wine, we're about six, seven weeks sometimes, depending on the year. So it depends on the wine you're looking to make. Uh, it depends on uh, the year that you're given because a hotter year, we're doing less drying and a cooler year or, or a wetter year, we're going to do more drying to get rid of a little bit more of that water content. Um, but it's, it's definitely a process that um, takes a long time. It's very labor intensive and it's very expensive. Um, we lose a lot, uh, you know, in terms of yield, we're losing anywhere from 20 to 30% of your yield. Uh, but, and it's also the hand harvesting, the hand harvesting, the placing in the trays, we're not putting it into bins. So it's a lot lot of extra labor, a uh, lot of extra cost associated, uh, associated with it. Um, is the pizza patio open or will it be opening? Oh, okay. Um, so out front of our winery, we, uh, every once in a while we do, or in the summer, we do pizza and wine by the glass outside. It's just very similar to a piazza in Italy where you can sit out and, and have a glass of wine. Uh, unfortunately, with everything going on this year, that's kind of been the last thing we were focusing on uh, to get open. And by this point, it seems like uh, we're, we won't be opening it this year, but hopefully next year we'll, we'll come back with a better and revamped version of, uh, of the piazza. Um, well, these questions are great. I love these questions. What, uh, what is the best way to store leftover wine? Not that it happens very often. <laughs> That's great. Um, so the best way, um, if, if you can, um, there's these rubber, basically the rubber stoppers and they, uh, it comes with a pump that pumps the air out, out of the, the bottle. If you have one of those, that's the best way. If you don't, um, cork back in and if you're not going to get to it for a while into the fridge no matter if it's white or red um, any chem uh, chemical reaction proceeds slower at uh, you know at your cooler temperatures so if you can put it into the fridge whether it's white or red um, uh, you it, that would be the best way to store it for a longer period of time uh, your reds will last generally two to three days uh, at the most you can probably push it to four depending on the wine your whites, if, again, if they're stored in the fridge, you're looking at at least three to four, maybe, maybe on the fifth, but that's, that's pushing it too. 
um, but good question there. Uh, do you use any other grapes other than your own? Um, we do a little bit. Uh, I would say we're about 80%. Nowadays, we're about 80% our own, um, 20% uh, you know, we buy from growers in the area for, for two couple, two things. The first being um, we, we buy the grapes for the fresh portion. So for example, the 80% is dried and 20% fresh. So a lot of times we'll buy uh, more of what we have as the fresh proponents. So for example, the Repasso buying more of the Cabernet Franc, more of the Cabernet Sauvignon just for, for volume. Um, and then why we don't buy more uh, in terms of the Apasamento is we're drying what we grow on our vineyard. So that's, uh, so we have control over that. Um, so we do buy a little bit, but not a lot. The other reason we do like to buy a little bit is we want to support the growers in the area. I mean, we used to be growers as well. And, uh, and we want to help support uh, those who are trying to do the, uh, the same thing. Uh, with respect to uh, uh, with respect to um, growing in uh, in Niagara, um, so we do buy a little bit, but most of it is uh, is our own. Um, uh, vegan friends, uh, are are there vegan dishes you suggest with these wines? Oh wow, uh, I am a very um, uh, I'm grew up in, in a non-vegan world. So this is going to be very, very tough for me. Um, in terms of the, the Merlot, like I said, if you did have that eggplant or that zucchini, um, at one point I had a uh, zucchini lasagna, I think it was, uh, they had made, um, and it was, um, uh, you know, rather than the noodles and that, they had layered the zucchini and, and had your, your still your tomato sauce and that, and that was actually pretty delicious. But I would put more of that with the, um, with the corposo, actually. That would be a, a really nice dish with the, uh, with the corposo. Um, with respect to the Pinot Grigio, oh, that's a that's a good question. Um, I don't know if I had a uh, a vegan pairing for the uh, for the Pinot Grigio. Um, I, you know what though, I've had some really some quote unquote vegan pastas, and they've actually been quite delicious. Um, uh, squash. Um, if you can do a pasta alle olio with um, with uh, squash uh, rather than the pasta, like a um, shredded squash, um, uh, or um, yeah, like a butternut squash um, alle olio. So basically, olive oil and uh, and that. Um, with the uh, with the Pinot Grigio, that would actually be spectacular. But that was a tough question for uh, for an Italian boy. So I hope I answered that as best as I uh, I could. Um, Chris, what's your favorite culinary wine? Oh boy, uh, that's a pick. That's like picking a child. Uh, <laughs> um, and I'm probably the wrong person to ask that question because I get bored very easily with with my wine. So if I if I drank the the uh, Pinot Grigio yesterday. I'll drink the uh, the Merlot today and so on. And I'm a very seasonal drinker too, so I will uh, I will generally drink my uh, my whites in the uh, in the summer, and my reds in the uh, in the winter. Um, having said that, there's exceptions to that rule. But when it's 30 degrees and and I'm sweating outside, very rarely will I go reach for a red wine. Um, I, I really don't have an answer. One one wine that uh, that I uh, uh, really really enjoy. Unfortunately, sorry. Um, is your winery open for tastings or the wine shop? Yes. So recently we were actually able to reopen for tastings, um, the wine shop as well. The wine shop is open seven days of the week. Um, we have a shop here at the, uh, at the winery. Um, you're welcome to come in and, and purchase in that. Uh, the, the tasting side though, we've had to really revamp everything with respect to everything that's been, uh, that's been going on. Um, and I think this leads to the other question that someone had here. Will we have tours in that? So we're not going to do any tours of the facility, um, but we will have, t we, we do have, have tastings now and the tastings um, have changed substantially and, and those who have been here before remember what it was like but for those who haven't we used to do it as a tasting bar style where you come up you can uh, you know uh, come in anytime you want walk up to the bar and you know if it wasn't busy then you could get a spot no problem now with um, with everything going on um, we've had to kind of revamp that and we've changed things around to the point where now everything is seated by appointment um, and for maximum groups of four at this point at least. And so it actually ends up being a better experience for people who are visiting because it's a very one-on-one -on -one experience. You're with our staff member for 45 minutes and you can fire away the questions. And, and frankly, that's kind of what a small winery like us really enjoys because uh, very rarely on a really busy Saturday do you get the chance to connect with somebody and now we're given that opportunity to do so. Unfortunately, that comes with very limited availability but the customer experience at the end of it, I, I think is much, much better uh, rather than elbowing someone who's next to you uh, on a busy Saturday. Um, so we are doing uh, tastings uh, from 11, uh, the earliest is 11 and the last one's five o'clock. Um, and throughout the summer, Thursday through Sunday, that's, that's what we've got right now. Thursday through Sunday, we're doing tastings and then the wine shop is open seven days of the week. Um, so I think that answers a couple of questions at once. Um, do you have a wine that you would recommend to pair with venison or would you like to eat in the fall and winter? Oh yes. Um, 
this uh, gamey things are what our bold reds love. Um, the Merlot could go really well with it. Um, our Cab Sauve, uh, I mean, our, our Cabernet Sauvignon and actually the Syrah, both of those wines, they're, uh, they're just so rich and so bold uh, and really go well with gamier feel. The reason I threw the Syrah in there is Syrah is a lot of times spicy. So it, if you like a little bit of a spicy feel to your food pairings, especially with something like venison, I think that Syrah is absolutely spectacular with it. But like I said, the Merlot you have in front of you is definitely not out of the question. Uh, it can definitely handle the gaminess of the, uh, of the venison. Uh, if I had my whole portfolio of wines, I would lean to the, uh, to the Syrah or the Capso, probably more so the Syrah because I like a little bit of the spice. Um, but I would lean to more, to more it's those two. But that's a great question, venison. Uh, what is the lifespan of a grapevine? Um, so when we're planting, uh, we, last thing we want is to constantly be replanting. So what ends up happening is if we can take care of the vine, we want to make it last as long as we possibly can. So um, they say up to 25 years, you'll get full um, thinning. You'll have to thin back the, the vine. It produces its full crop and it's, it's producing like crazy. After your 25 years, naturally the vine starts producing less. After 50 years, you're producing much, much less. So it's, if you take care of things, and in Niagara, it's a little harder than in other areas to really take care of things consistently um, because of the weather we're dealing with and, and everything else. Um, we, we try to push it. You can definitely go to that 50-year mark. That's, that's not a problem. It's just a lot of times you encounter certain um, things in the vineyard that, you know, over and over winter damage. You know, little by little, it starts to you know, break down the vine and you end up having to replace it. So um, a lot of times you want to leave it as much as you possibly can, but there are times where we do have to uh, replant them. Um, our vines are at this point replanted in 04, so they're now uh, 16 years old. So we're not quite to that 25 year point where they start to naturally uh, thin themselves out. Um, but we hope to, that we can keep our vineyard, uh, our vines rocking as long as we, uh, as long as we possibly, uh, as long as we possibly can. Um, I see a number of, uh, of other wines on your list. Is it possible to hold a virtual tasting with some of the other wines? Oh, good question. Um, we haven't done that just, uh, just yet. Um, we might do that in the future. Um, but uh, as of right now, we haven't done a whole virtual tasting. Hopefully we can, uh, we can do another one where, uh, where we do another three wines or another four wines or whatever have you. Uh, but uh, as of right now, we have nothing planned. But um, uh, hopefully in the future, we definitely, uh, definitely can. Uh, where's the winery and how do we get there? Perfect. Um, we, like I said, we're in Niagara on the Lake. Uh, we're in the St. David's Bench area. So we're not right in the heart of Niagara on the Lake. We're probably the closest winery um, to the, uh, the highway for you. So um, as you're coming from the QEW, which I think most of you are Hamilton, Toronto area. So once you come down the QEW, it's your first, ex the uh, Glendale Avenue exit. You come off the highway, you make a right, and you're onto York Road, and we're just a, a quick trip down the down York Road. So we're uh, we're maybe five minutes from the uh, from the highway. Um, so we're we're actually quite easy to get to uh, in that respect. But we are in in Niagara on the Lake, um, and uh, yeah. So it, it, you pass Beamsville area, so you you have to pass the Beamsville area before we get to uh, uh, you get to Niagara on the Lake. There's lots of great wineries out in the Beamsville area as well. Um, I, there's a lot of wineries to, to do along the way, so uh, you might not be doing it all in one trip, but once you get to Niagara Lake, we're actually one of the first ones you'll hit coming off of the, uh, coming off of the highway. So, but good question. Um, I don't know how I'm doing with time, Dave, uh, if I'm allowed to answer more questions uh, or that, but uh, typical Italian, like I said, we like to talk. Um, but um, if, yeah, uh, yeah. if you have any, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, if we have, uh, maybe uh, if anybody has any uh, last questions, maybe we'll answer two or three more if they uh if they flow in so uh and then we'll then we'll call it a day i think sounds good yeah perfect um so uh, it looks like uh, when when will you be ready for weddings that's a that's a good one Ewald. Uh, um unfortunately i don't know if we'll be ever go down that uh, that road um we get uh, asked often uh, with respect to to weddings uh, if we're going to host them uh, i don't think we're going to go down that road with respect to the wedding side of things unfortunately uh, uh, as much as we would uh, we would love to but uh, i don't think it's something that's currently in the plans however you never know things might change uh, down the road uh, we'll see uh, we'll see how that uh, how that goes but good question yeah 
Any other questions that anybody has, please fire away. I'm happy to, uh, to answer them. Um, but uh, I, I don't know if anybody's actually tried the wines as we've been going along or uh, any interesting feedback that you, that you had. Um, I've tried these wines many times, so I, I always think they're fantastic. And people always ask me, oh, Chris, do you, do you like the wines? I'm like, well, I'm, I'm a biased answer. So I, I really hope uh, everyone is enjoying the wines uh, or if you're having the food pairings with them you're having good uh, a good time with the with that side of things uh, uh, this is something that um, we love doing again like i said uh, talking about wine and, and talking about uh, these questions are, are so so fantastic um, we have all three in front of us they're amazing thank you logan that's that's fantastic uh, i love that um, it, they're they're definitely for us it's a sense of pride uh, we really are um, enjoying making these wines um, kind of a tribute to our heritage yes it's a lot of work to to do it but Hopefully we can uh, we can um, uh, you know please most people's palates, which is great. Are you available in the LCBO? We are not. Uh, we um, we're like I said, a smaller winery. The LCBO. Um I'm going to censor this. Uh, LCBO is uh, is a great distribution method for um, a large manufacturer. And what I say that is they they're very good at um, uh, at pushing volume quite quickly. Um, whereas with us, we're a small place. Um, so they, um, it's not really conducive to our method of operation, not to mention the price point where there's no way for us to market it. Uh, you're not tasting it in that. So, you know, for example, Pinot Grigio at $21.95 versus Pinot Grigio at $10 in the LCBO when you don't know anything about the wine is very, uh, very hard to, to kind of compete. So we say, you know what? We'd rather have the wines here for people who visit us and our loyal friends that visit us all the time. And, uh, and then we can ship it to you as, uh, as well. Um, we've tried all the wines and have gone along. We've enjoyed them. The Porthouse, Porthouse Steak. Wow. With the Merlot. Thanks for, I, I, now I want Porthouse Steak, but uh, Porthouse Steak absolutely is a fantastic pairing with, uh, with the Merlot. That's a great, great uh, uh, thing to, um, to bring up. Um, the, um, the, and that's the beauty of that Merlot is that you can really, really uh, get some some good food pairings and some really nice uh, um, power from it to go out, go with that uh, that steak. Where a lot of times Merlot kind of falls a little flat with respect to that. Um, Merlot is surprisingly good. I'm liking that. I like that uh, that answer uh, uh, with respect to um, with the Merlot because again, a lot of people say, you know what, Merlot is not my thing. It's too thin. You know, not a lot to it. And that's why I love. Uh, showcasing the the Merlot uh, be, just to, to try something completely different. Um, there's a couple of wine club members on here and some loyal friends and and uh, you guys have all been really rocking. Thank you so much. Um, the recipes with the wine club are wonderful. That's that's great to hear. Um, there with our wine club we. We send out a wine club every uh, every month with a couple bottles of wine, and we uh, we send recipes, uh, food pairing suggestions, technical notes, uh, things like what's going on in the vineyard, um, events, and th when we can do events, uh, you know, invitations to events and things like that. Um, it's uh, so we we do have a wine club as well. If if you were looking to to get a hold of the wines as well. But uh, no, these were, these were all great questions. Uh, virtual hugs from Anne. Thank you, Anne. You guys are the best. Uh, uh, thank you so much. And thank you guys for, for joining the, uh, the webinar. It really, uh, again, warms our heart that people are actually interested in taking the time on a, on a Thursday afternoon at four o'clock to, to join us. Uh, that really, uh, that, does, that does mean a lot to, to not just me, but my entire family. Everybody knows that I'm doing this right now and, uh, and they send uh, their thanks out uh, as well as, uh, as just for me. Um, how do we join the wine club? Um, couple of ways. You can uh, submit a form online. You can uh, talk to us in person. Um, either way, uh, we're happy to, uh, happy to, to let you know. We're a phone call away. A lot of times I'm the one answering the phone uh, or someone who answers uh, could be actually the wine club director. Um, so uh, either way, if you want to do it online or give me a call, I'm happy to, to chat with you uh, whenever you catch me on the phone. Um, if I was to purchase these three for my seller, how long can I keep and age them? Good question. Uh, the Pinot Grigio, surprisingly, with the, with the body of it, you can actually do a decent amount of aging uh, with it. Uh, you, I wouldn't be surprised. Like I, I went to, back to a 2011 of ours uh, not too long ago, and it was doing surprisingly well. So that Pinot Grigio, don't be surprised if even five years down the road, you're, uh, you're okay with it. Uh, it's not a wine that we necessarily intend for long-term aging, but it's definitely a wine that, um, uh, that you can... Uh, put down without worry. The Repasso, again, not a wine that we look for long-term aging with, because like I said, it's that wine for every day with whatever, however, but 
again, five to eight years is not an issue with the, uh, with the Repasso. Um, most people, it lasts five to eight minutes in their cellar, but if you're looking to age it for a long period of time, the um, five to eight years is comfortable with the, uh, with the Repasso. The Merlot, however, is not a problem seven to 10, and that's surprising a lot of people with, with the Merlot, but not a problem. Seven to 10 years um, is kind of how, where I, I go, go with the Merlot, being that it's so rich and so bold. I hope I've answered everyone's questions and please, uh, I, this is not, uh, you know, as you're, um, uh, you know, exiting the webinar, please, this is not, uh, you know, goodbye and, and, and you can't never talk to us again. Please just give me a call. I'm, I'm always at the winery and if you forgot to ask a question or need to know anything else about these wines or any other wines, please give me a call or send me an email. I'm happy to, uh, to interact with you guys uh, uh, with anything else you, uh, you need. Uh, we're having our, our two wines with our friends in Port Dover. Oh, that's awesome, Tony. That's great. Merlot for dinner. Fantastic. Thank you, guys. I'm, we love this. We love uh, hearing these, uh, these comments. So thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody uh, uh, for it. And like I said, please uh, give us a shout. Call us. Uh, hopefully, you can visit us. If you do visit us, let me know you're here. That way I can come in uh, and say hi and, uh, and talk to you a little bit about the wines we, uh, we had. Uh, and hopefully you can taste a, a few more of them as you, uh, as you visit us. And, uh, and I can see you in person uh, rather than as a, a black screen. So hopefully, uh, hopefully you take the time to visit us and, uh, and I can see you in person.